have a King James Bible there'll be an usher by your side in just a minute thanks Tim Billy I asked him I wanted to hear him sing again he came to me if you don't have a King James Bible where's David Critchfield John did you escape just one day it's good to see you brother and my heart goes out to all of you federal employees that lost your job this week as the government shut down. It's, a, it's, a, it's amazing how, how we handle these catastrophes in life. Thank you. Boy, you are multitasking today, Ernie. 
Who is supposed to be over here, David? John Oh, my. Well, John has other jobs to do. I don't know. He's the locksmith. He has a lot of power around here. He can, he can lock us all out of the place. Find Psalm 3, please, if you would. This had to be one of the most difficult days in King David's life. His own son had turned on him and, and not only stole the kingdom, but wanted to kill his own dad. Psalm 3. The headings in Psalms are part of the inspired preserved scripture, by the way. A Psalm of David when he fled from Absalom, his son. Lord, how are they increased to trouble me? Many they are that are they that rise up against me. Many there be which say of my soul, there is no help for him in God. Can you imagine that? People were saying for David, things are so bad, David. It, things are so bad, David, even God can't help him. Sila is a musical term. It's a rest uh, in a way of saying, think about that. Just ponder that. Things are so bad that even God couldn't help David. Uh, but the but thou in the Bible. But thou, O Lord, art a shield for me. You're my glory, the lifter up of mine head. I cried unto the Lord with my voice, and he heard me out of his holy hill, Selah. So you can choose what you want to think about. You can think about what other people are saying, or you can think about who God is and what God has said. My glory and the lifter of my head. You're my glory and the lifter of my head. But thou, O Lord, art a shield for me. My glory and the lifter of my head. I cried unto the Lord with my voice. <coughs> With my voice, I, <coughs> and he heard me, and he heard me. My glory and the lifter of my head, he's my glory and the lifter of my head. But thou, O Lord, art a shield for me, my glory and the lifter of my head. Psalm 5, you're not too far away from that. Give ear to my words, O Lord, consider my meditation. Hearken unto the voice of my cry. You're my king, you're my God. Psalm 5, the first two, uh, actually the first three verses. Give ear to my words, O Lord, consider my meditation. Hearken unto the voice of my cry my King and my God, for unto thee will I pray. My voice shall back here in the morning, O Lord, in the morning will I direct my prayer unto thee. That's a good place to direct your prayer to the Lord. Give me to my word, O Lord, consider my meditation. I can answer the voice of good, thank you. My King and my God, for unto thee will I pray, and my voice shall back here in the morning. O Lord, in the morning will I direct my prayer unto thee, and will look up. Now the last two verses of that same psalm, and then we'll introduce our guest preacher this morning. You're going to be so glad you came to the house of God today. By the way, I hope the Lord heard your voice already this morning. Long before you gathered here in the, in the morning, you're going to hear from me. And uh, that's a good place to start prayer and the meditation on the Word of God. Let all those that put their trust in thee rejoice. Let them ever shout for joy. For thou defendest and hand that them also that love thy name be joyful in thee. For thou, O Lord, will bless the righteous. With favor will thou comfort him as with the ship. Let all those that put their trust in thee rejoice. Let them ever shout for joy. For thou defendest them and let them also let love thy name be joyful in thee. For thou, O Lord, will bless the righteous. With favor will 
thou comest in him as with a shield. And all God's people said, I want to introduce to you my bride of 42 years. You can tell when she stands up, I married a much younger woman. And so, honey, if you would please stand up, turn around, smile at everybody. And there she is right there. Okay, thank you, sweetie. You can be seated. And, you know, that's very interesting because I can even control my hot water heater from my cell phone. And right now it's on vacation mode. Does that mean that you're on vacation? No, it's just on vacation mode. That means it's not heating the water when we're not there. But uh, it's wonderful. I can look at, at the front yard of my house through my cell phone. I can look at the interior of my house through my cell phone. And, uh, but it's, you know, it's, it's crazy, the things we can do with electronics when they work. <sighs> and when they don't, you feel like throwing them out the window, you know. I uh, learned last night from some techies over at Brother Mike's house that uh, my cell phone, the cell phone, the iPhone 6 Plus, is the worst <laughs> of all of them. So I'll be upgrading soon. And, uh, but uh, yeah, I, uh, I've been very frustrated of late <clears throat> with my cell phone. And, and, uh, but hey, you know, I mean, it's all right. The Lord knows, right? Now, I know we have a time limit here, right, Brother Duffett? Yeah, because we have to, what, what time do you want me? 10 o'clock, okay. So as King Henry VIII told his second wife, I won't keep you long, okay? And that's just a test to see if you're awake. So it's like, a, it's like 16th of you are there, that are awake today. The rest of you, just go ahead and sleep and with your eyes open, and hopefully the Lord will wake you up soon. But, but our ministry is called Awake America because I found something out a long time ago. We've been sleeping as to our biblical responsibility to our government for many decades. And it's time that we wake up again. A lot of people say, well, all those people in Washington, D.C. No, 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 no. It's not the people in Washington, D.C. Yeah, all this stuff that's going on. You understand that our document, the Constitution of the United States, begins with the words, we the people. So people ask me, and I ask them, where do you think the government sits? Well, it sits in our state capitol, of course, here. I always thought it was really strange, Alaska that you have your state capital on an island. Maybe that's so people can't get to them as easily <laughs> as they would like to and wring their necks every once in a while, like we do in all the other states, the, the lower 48, as, as you say. But uh, that's not where the government sits, nor does the government sit in the nation's capital. I'm looking at the government. The problem is most people, Americans, even most Christians, have never even read the Constitution of the United States have no working knowledge of the Constitution. You know probably here in Alaska more than most. No matter what kind of a weapon you have, no matter how effective it is, how powerful it is, if you don't know how to use that weapon, it's useless. If you don't know which side is the fire side, it's deadly. And what I'm saying is we have the most miraculous governmental document in the history of mankind. Why is that, Brother Harding? because it's based upon the most miraculous document. There are 28 biblical principles in the Constitution of the United States, and yet we don't know it. And if we don't know it, how can we be self-governed people? And so my call now for well over a decade, going on towards 15 years, has been just to try to get people re-educated as to who we are engaged in the process of our biblical responsibility to government. All people say, well, Brother Harding, <laughs> you don't understand. It's not spiritual to be involved in government. You know, separation of church and state keeps us Christians out of government. And I said, really, where do you find that? Oh, it's in the Constitution. I said, it is? You know when you go soul winning and someone tells you something really wild about the Bible and you hand them your New Testament and say, well, where is that? And they're flipping through the New Testament. Well, I know it's in here somewhere. And you finally... After they get exasperated for a few seconds, you, you give them a way out, and you kindly but firmly say, no, it's not in there. But this is what is it's in there. Well, the separation of church and state, as we have been taught, is not in the Constitution. But what is in the Constitution is that Congress shall make no law respecting the establishment of religion or prohibiting the free exercise thereof. So then what's it, why, why won't... They allow chaplains to pray then in the name of Jesus Christ anymore in our military. And why is there such opposition to Christians? Well, the reason why is because we, God's people, 
especially us independent Baptists. The Baptists have always been the standard bearers. I was telling Brother Mike and Leanne and their family last night, and boy, I'm telling you, we were always way out in front of everyone else, but now the standard bearers have become the bystanders. And we don't know that we should be educated, engaged. We need to be entreating God's mercy for our country. Why is that, Brother Harding? Because you understand that God says that the shedding of innocent blood, he does not pardon. You understand that God says, in thy skirts is found the blood of the souls of the poor innocents, and that we as a nation have seen, because of our inactivity, over 60 million of our citizens tortured to death under the guise of abortion. There's 9-11s that occur every week in America on the average. And we, God's people, need to entreat God's mercy upon our country. Back in the 1800s, do you know they were having problem with abortion back in those days? Thomas Jefferson, along with some of our other founding fathers, passed laws against abortion. And this is what Thomas Jefferson said, relating to that and other things that were egregious to a thrice holy God. I tremble for my country when I realize that God's wrath will not always slumber. See, I don't want to see anything catastrophically occur in this country. He said, well, 9-11, uh, that was God's judgment. No, no, that was God's warning. You never want to see God's judgment upon a country. I'm not talking about thousands. When God enters into the picture and judges, for us it would be millions. We don't ever want to see that. And so we need to entreat God's mercy upon our country each and every day. We need to encourage others to do the same. And we do those first four, get educated, get engaged, and treat God's mercy, encourage others so we can do the most important thing, and that is to evangelize the lost. The most important thing for us as independent Baptists is to see people come to the knowledge of the truth. And it isn't wonderful that truth has a name, and his name is Jesus Christ. I am the truth, he said, the life. Amen? The way. There's no other way to God but through Jesus Christ. And so we need to keep our civil liberty maintained so the spiritual liberty of the Lord Jesus Christ can go fast forward in this nation. And that's what Awake America is. So, well, uh, I think I'm pretty educated about my country. Let me ask you a question. Who was the first president of the United States? George Washington. Well, actually, no, he was the ninth president. There were eight presidents before him under the Continental Congress. He was the only the first president under the Constitution. Now listen, that gave us a more perfect union. That means there was a union before then. There was a nation before then. We established ourselves as a nation in the 1700s. It wasn't until the 1800s that the Constitution was proposed, formulated, and adopted. First president of the United States. There's a highway named after him around Washington, D.C. His name was John Hanson. John Hancock was another one of the presidents. And these men to us are known, but they're not known as to who they were and what they did. In fact, they were elected much like George Washington was, with very similar powers to George Washington as well. And so we need to understand, hey, Paul Revere didn't ride through the town crying the British are coming. <laughs> Why? That's what our history books say. No, that's what a poem says. And so why did they use Paul Revere's name? Because it, it rhymed easier than William Dawes or Cheswell Wentworth, the black man that rode north for Boston. See, our black brothers and sisters were left out of history as well, you see. These things we need to once again re-educate ourselves with and realize, you see, we're unique in the world, not because we're better than anyone else, but because our founding father collectively as a government said there is a God and God gives us certain unalienable rights, life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. That makes us unique in the world and in world history. I want you to understand something. We are the only other nation in the history of mankind that started from the premise of the truth of God's word. Israel and America. Israel was a theocracy. We're not a theocracy, but by the way, we're not a democracy either. 
it's to the republic for which it stands, one nation under God. And we don't even know many times what a difference between a republic and a democracy is. And so all of these things we need to once again glean and recapture and, and reinitiate into our minds and our hearts to understand even Great Britain with their great missionary efforts of yesteryear, they did not start with the truth. They came to the truth. All nations have come to the truth. If they've come to the truth at all, America started with the truth. And because of that, we're so unique. And we need to hold on to that so our children and our grandchildren can grow up in a nation that we grew up in, can think and live free. And so all of these things that we have been basically putting aside, forgetting for decades, we need to once again remember and be the conscience of our nation. And so in saying that, uh, I'd like you, if you would please, take your Bibles and go with me over to Isaiah. Isaiah, and I, I just want to share some things with you this morning, and I'm going to entitle this message, America's Alzheimer's Disease, because we have forgotten, you see, and, and uh, Alzheimer's is a very cruel malady. Uh, it starts, first of all, with a person forgetting their way. And then they start forgetting their personal history, you see. They lose their way, they lose their self, and then they lose their life. America is losing its way. America is forgetting who we are, you see. I remember a senator was just reelected. He felt really good about himself, and he wanted to go visit his, his constituents and thank them for voting him back in. And so they were driving through his state, and, and they were driving by past a nursing home. He said, oh, let's go visit the dear people in the nursing home. And so they walked in, and he walked up to the first lady sitting there right by where the nurse's station was, and again, feeling very good about himself, he said, do you know who I am? She said, oh, honey, don't worry about that. You ask the nurse, she'll tell you who you are. <laughs> See, we've forgotten who we are. We need to remember that, you see? and then teach others as well. And, uh, and so uh, I just want to draw our attention here to Isaiah chapter 1 and give you a few verses, and then let's look to the Lord and see what he will uh, give us this morning. Isaiah chapter 1 and verse 1, it says, The vision of Isaiah, the son of Amaz, Amos, which he saw concerning Judah and Jerusalem in the days of Uzziah, Jotham, Ahaz, and Hezekiah, kings of Judah. Hear, O heavens, and give ear, O earth, for the Lord hath spoken. I have nourished and brought up children, and they have rebelled against me. The ox knoweth his owner, the ass his master's crib, but Israel doth not know. My people doth not consider. O sinful nation, a people laden with iniquity, a seed of evildoers, children that are corruptors, they have forsaken the Lord, they have provoked the Holy One of Israel unto anger. They are gone away backward. Why should you be stricken any more? Ye will revolt more and more. Now I want you to look at these next two phrases and mark them now. The whole head is sick and the whole heart faint. From the sole of the foot even unto the head there is no soundness in it but wounds and bruises and putrefying sores. They have not been closed, neither bound up, neither mollified with ointment. Your country is desolate. Your cities are burned with fire. Your land, strangers devour it in your presence. And it is desolate, is overthrown by strangers. And the daughter of Zion is left as a cottage in a vineyard, as a lodge in a garden of cucumbers, as of a siege city. That's a very vulnerable state. That's where we are tonight as America. We are today as America what Israel was yesteryear. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you now for loving us, and dear God, now we go forward in thy word, but Father, we want to follow you. And dear God, we ask through and by that holy unction, that blessed and holy ghost, that you would illuminate our minds and our hearts, enlarge and enlighten, Lord, show us those things to come, lead and guide us into all truth, uh, create and maintain a hedge protection around this assembly, and bind off the wicked one, anything that would keep us from focusing upon these eternal truths. Dear God, help the concerns and burdens of life just to vanish for a while, and the aches and pains to dissipate. But, oh God, we ask that through and by 
your touch, Lord, as I step back, that you would step forward. And every word that's said might be seasoned by thy grace, infused through and by thy glory into our minds and our hearts, and we will be very careful to give you all the praise and glory for what you're about to do in the lives of each and every one of us, your people. For we ask this in the precious name of your Son and our Savior, and by the power and the merit and the authority that is in the name of Jesus Christ, we pray. Amen. Amen. So, in thinking of America today, I think it's only fitting that we think of the other nation that was founded through and by the truth of God, the nation of Israel. A nation also, I believe, that was truly blessed. A nation that went up against insurmountable foes, and as long as they were right with God, they beat back every foe. Now, why is that? I'll tell you why. Because God fought for them, that's why. Yeah. Now, our nation's history is very similar because our founding fathers, they said before they mutually pledged to each other their lives, their fortunes, and their sacred honor, they said with firm reliance upon the protection of divine providence. What they were saying was, we believe that God is going to fight for us. And although there is no human means by which we are going to be able to win this war, we believe by spiritual means, by a holy God, he will fight for us in this endeavor. They called themselves the second Israel. They call this nation the Israel that was coming after God's Israel. In fact, the first seal of the United States proposed by Dr. Benjamin Franklin himself was Moses leading the children of Israel through the Red Sea with a pillar of fire in the background, and around it were the words, rebellion to tyrants is obedience to God. I've even heard some of our brethren say, I'm not sure if it was right for us to rebel against the king. Are you kidding me? It's not right to rebel against tyranny, against a monarch, who by even by the world standards at that time was not obeying his own rules. And my, may I say this, international law said that if a monarch no longer gave to his subjects their due as far as his responsibility to basically protect them and provide for them in a certain manner, then they had no longer any responsibility to hold allegiance to him. Right. That's exactly what they declared in the declaration of the original 13 colonies. These things that were known to the whole world under international law that was based upon God's law. They were declaring that we no longer have any obedience due to the king. And we want everyone to understand that you can come and you can aid us in this because you're within your rights nationally. I don't know about you, but when I look at our founding fathers and I realize what they were doing, they were doing something very biblical, very spiritual, that has given us the greatest nation in modern history. And so as we look at the nation of Israel, I think we understand some things that I believe many people don't, and that's history, his story. And the fact that History is God's story. It's God's relation to man and man's interaction back to him, you see. And too many times what we see is, and what we don't understand, is history is cyclic. What has been is going to be again. I mean, it goes around and around. And when you come to Washington, D.C., if you ever see the National Archives that houses the Declaration of Independence and the Bill of Rights and the other documents that we base our nation upon, one of the foundational Pillars says these words, the past is prologue. Well, I believe that's based upon the Bible because if you want to know what God's going to do, you look at what God has done. See, it says this in Ecclesiastes chapter 1 and verse 9. The thing that hath been, it is that which shall be. And that which is done is that which shall be done, and there is no new thing under the sun. It also says in Ecclesiastes chapter 3 and verse 15, that which hath been is now, and that which to be hath already been, and God requireth that which is past. So he wants us to be students of history. People say, well, Brother Harding, I don't like history. History is boring. If you think history is boring, you didn't have a good history teacher. Because I'll guarantee you, when you put God into the mix, history is fascinating. It's amazing. Uh, when I taught history, uh, in Bible college, they put me all the way down at the end of the hall because they knew semantics were going to go on. And when I taught on Lincoln's assassination, I brought in a replica of the gun that John Wilkes Booth used. And I went through the whole scenario, knowing that he was an actor. 
He knew the play that they were performing there at Ford's Theater. My wife and I have been to Ford's Theater. We saw a Christmas carol performed there uh, several years ago. And the booth where Lincoln was assassinated, of course, is still draped in uh, different types of bunting, red, white, and blue, and flags. But as Booth walked up, he waited for the punchline. He knew when the audience was going to laugh, and that's when he opened the door. As he began to approach Lincoln, again, he waited for the next punchline. And as I was doing this, the gun that I had, unbeknownst to my students, was loaded with a pretty good charge of black powder in my classroom. Now, I didn't have a projectile in it. I didn't want it to be that realistic. <laughs> but as I approached step by step and going through the whole manner of how John Wilkes Booth knew exactly when it was going to happen, as I approached and as I caught to that point where the gun was to be discharged. Bang! Just like that, the gun went off. And thank you very much, because that's what my students did. They jumped just like that but when the gun went off. Okay. But what I was trying to do, I was trying to make history live for them and understand all the different facets of it. Because, hey, folks, what we are today is the culmination of our personal histories. What's going on in the present has been determined by the past. We are the sum total of everything that's happened to us and how we have responded to it, positively or negatively, you see. And one thing that we learn from history, and that is we don't learn from history. And if you don't learn from history, you are doomed to repeat the mistakes that someone else has already made. And that is a bad case of the stupids. So I said, Brother Harney, don't say the word stupid. It's provocative. That's why I say it. Yeah. Actually, the etymology, the study of the word stupid, is from the Germanic term stupig, meaning the runt of the litter. It's runt reasoning, you see. One of our presidents said, we're doing a futile thing if we do not know from whence we came and what we've been all about, you see. So the reason why we are where we are is because of the past. If we want to see what the future is going to hold, we need to look to the past, realize where we are, and that's the way we can wisely proceed towards the future. Sure. By looking at the successes and emulating them and the disappointments and the pitfalls and the mistakes in avoiding them, you see. That's why it says in this scripture portion right here, the whole head is sick and the whole heart faint. Because you see, that's the step one and step two of the three downward digression to begin to worship false gods, individually, corporately, nationally. People start forgetting who God is. It doesn't happen overnight. They stop reading the Bible. They stop coming to church. They stop associating with Christians. And then once they stop forgetting what God has done for them, what he's doing for them, what he will do for them, then they start to not just forget God with their mind, but they start forsaking God with their heart. You're right. And then they start following false gods with their life. Well, I don't see any false gods. Hey, there's all kinds of false gods in the world. Prosperity and prestige and the pride of man. It's, it's not changed. We may not bow down to the actual altars, but we are still bowing down to things like professional sports. Huh? where, you know, the Super Bowl held on Sunday and preachers are begging their people, begging their people to come to church over the Super Bowl? God have mercy! You know, I have, I have a good friend. He's going to be flipping the coin. He's a Medal of Honor recipient from World War II. Going to be flipping the coin. I'm not watching the Super Bowl. Oh, you're, you're going to tape it, right? I'm not even going to tape it and watch it. Well, why is that, Brother Harney? Well, see... I know a lot of people that have fought for this country, that the flag means something far beyond to them that it does to those people that have never paid the price. And as long as there's anyone on any football team that they're not making stand to the pledge of our flag, where they already have the rules to stand to the pledge to our flag, and they are afraid of them, more than they are loyal to our, I'm not going to watch NFL football. That's just my decision. I'm not trying to affect you. You make your own decision. 
that's just who I am. So I'm never going to not never ever watch another NFL football game in my life until they start doing something about it. You know, if everyone did that, I'll guarantee you, everyone would be standing for the pledge. And they can air their social differences somewhere else. There's, there's venues for that. But the football game, look, is, but see, that's who we are. We're bowing down to professional sports in this country. It's a God to us. We need to understand some things, realize some things about who God is and remember those things. Look with me, if you would, please, over to Isaiah chapter 46 and verse 9. What did God help his people to do when they started to lose the fact of who he was? Well, he even says, look, an animal will know his master. But Israel, you forget who I am? Come on. You understand Alzheimer's? Very cruel. My wife's mother, my mother-in-law, sweet lady, two sisters. The three sisters, my mother-in-law and her two sisters, went up to take care of Joe's, my wife's grandmother, their mother. They treated her with tender, loving kindness all day long. And I mean, waited on her every whim at the end of the day. She looked at those three ladies who were their daughters, and this is what she said. Are you... You're nice ladies. Do you work here? And my mother-in-law said, you have no idea how much that shocked us and hurt us. That our own mother no longer recognized who we were. Can you imagine the hurt that God experiences? When he looked at Israel, when he looks at America and says, America, I've made you the greatest nation in modern history. I've given you more technological advantages than all the rest of the nations put together. And yet you've forgotten who I am? You see? Isaiah chapter 46 and verse 9. Look at it with me. It says here, remember the former things of old. So what God wanted them to remember. For I am God, and there is none else. I am God, and there is none like me, declaring the end from the beginning. See, he says, I sit in eternity. From ancient times, things that are not yet done, saying, my counsel shall stand. I will do all my pleasure, calling a ravenous bird from the east, the man that executeth my counsel from a far country. Yea, I have spoken it. I will also bring it to pass. I purposed it. I will also do it. And so what God's saying here is, you need to remember who I am. I have given you some things to remember me. And some of those things you say, what are they? Well, they're memorials. Look with me to Joshua chapter 4, if you would please. Joshua chapter 4, and this is, of course, where God has given them a type of memorial in the crossing of the Jordan River. Chapter 4 and verse 1, And it came to pass when all the people were clean, passed over Jordan, that the Lord spake unto Joshua, saying, Take you twelve men out of the people, out of every tribe of man, and command you them, saying, Take you hence out of the midst of Jordan, out of the place where the priest's feet stood firm, twelve stones. And you shall carry them over with you and leave them in the lodging place where you shall lodge this night. Then Joshua called the 12 men who had prepared. He had prepared the children of Israel out of every tribe of man. And Joshua said unto them, pass over. And so they took these big rocks. These were the linebackers of the children of Israel, okay? And they put those rocks and they piled them up on the east side of Jordan to commemorate what God had done. And the reason why, in verse 6, it says that this may be a sign among you that when your children ask their fathers in time to come, saying, what mean ye by these stones, then ye shall answer them that the waters of Jordan were cut off before the ark of the covenant of the Lord when it passed over Jordan. The waters of Jordan were cut off, and these stones shall be a memorial. A memorial. Is that what it says, church? A memorial unto the children of Israel forever. So get this now. Years later, here comes a little boy with his daddy, and he sees those stones. Pulls in his dad's britches and says, Dad, what are those? The father and the son walk over to the stones. The dad looks at that little boy's face, looking at him in wonder. He said, oh, son, I wish you could have been here. I wish you could have seen as the priests carrying the Ark of the Covenant of our God moved into the Jordan. The little boy looks over the Jordan, and there the rushing water of the Jordan is streaming past him. He said, son, when the priest carried the ark into the Jordan, God's power pushed the waters back. 
And son, we as a nation walked across on dry ground. Maybe he relates what happened at the Red Sea from his ancestors. And then he talks about the different battles and the Battle of Jericho, how the walls came down. What he was doing was telling that little boy, I wish, son, you could have been here. God was so powerful for us. So powerful for us, for us. He fought for us and he did this for us. And the little boy looking up at his dad with his eyes wide. You say, what was he doing? What that man was doing and what God wanted all of the people of Israel to do is actually shown in Psalm 78. If you would please turn there. Psalm 78 and verse 4. It talks about the dark sayings of old and it relates that we will not hide them from their children, showing to the generation to come three things, the praises of the Lord and his strength and his wonderful works that he hath done. In verse 5, for he established a testimony in Jacob and appointed a law in Israel, which he commanded our fathers that they should make them known to their children. Look at this in verse 6 now of Psalm 78, that the generation to come might know them, even the children which should be born, who should arise and declare them to their children, that they might set their hope in God and not forget the works of God, but keep his commandments. Wow. You know the problem with America today? We haven't shown the generation to come as we should. The praises of our Lord and his works, his mighty power that he has performed in this nation time and time again. And because of that, we have a generation of snowflakes that they have to pass out Play-Doh and coloring books because the last election didn't go exactly the way they wanted to. And so they have to displace some of their stress. And our universities, too many times, the liberal ones especially, have turned into daycares instead of institutions of higher learning. You know what I, you know what I say to that generation? Suck it up, buttercup. Because this is life, and sometimes you will have some failures, but they should be used to propel us to the next victory, you see. The reason why these young people have voted for liberal, godless people is because they have not put their hope in God. They're putting their hope in man. They're putting their hope in the government. Our Father, who art in Washington, D.C., hallowed be thy legal processes, give me this day, more things, and I'll give you more liberty in exchange. And that is never a good trade-off. Free stuff, for three, for, you, you, you might say for freedom. No, no, no. That's something we do not want to go to. A government that can do anything for you can't do anything to you. So we need to be careful. We need to be very careful about what we allow the government to do for us. And we need to understand these things that have been passed on to us time and time again. I've gone to Washington, D.C., and I've seen all these monuments and memorials, and, and I understand something. These are not just a people and the circumstances. These memorials, these monuments, are a tribute to God and what God's done for us. If you take a line and you draw it from the Capitol down to the Lincoln and from the Washington Monument over to the Jefferson, it forms a perfect cross. The apex of that cross stands the Washington Monument. It's 555 feet high. It's the number of God's grace times three. No accident by design. On the top capstone, in the aluminum capstone, which was a very unique alloy in those days, are etched these words, Laos Dio, visible only to heaven. There's a city ordinance that no other building can be built higher than the Washington Monument because when the sun crests over the trees, the first thing that it illuminates is the capstone because our founding fathers wanted when God looked down at the federal city to see those words in Latin and remember that this nation, represented by this city, was founded to bring praise and honor and glory to him. That's who we are. And we need to stop buying in to all of these things that try to divide us as Americans and start realizing that that's the spirit of the Antichrist. We're all made of one blood, and we have a commonality in the fact that we are all Americans. We all have a part in this experiment of liberty. Hey, the spirit of the Lord Jesus Christ is reconciliation. It's restoration. It's bringing people together, not separating people. 
And so we need to understand these things and realize and be that blameless and that harmless, those sons of God, without rebuke in the midst of a purpose, with, with, in the midst of a crooked and perverse nation. Thank you. Whom we've, that's where we, we are, isn't it? And what are we supposed to be doing? Holding forth the words of life. Amen? I mean, this, this is so unique, what we've been called upon to do. This is the most exciting time for Christian to live right now. So uh, I just feel helpless. I'm going to tell you in Sunday school why you shouldn't feel helpless and why this church right here has made huge strides towards our country because of what your pastor in this church has done to affect pastors from this state to get to Washington, D.C., and provide the light and the soul. I'm going to show you some actual tangible things that have occurred because of you being here and following your pastor's leadership and because of who your pastor is and following the Lord's leadership as the under-shepherd and what this church has affected this nation nationally, and may I even say this, internationally and eternally for the cause of Christ. I'm going to show you that in Sunday school. But what I'm saying, we need to remember who we are. Too many times we see these revisionist historians taking God out of history, out of his story. I made reference to Paul Revere riding through the town, crying the British are coming. Well, that didn't happen because only one-third of the populace was on the side of the patriots. And if he had rode through the town crying the British are coming, he would have been captured like that. In fact, he was captured on his way and got out, escaped from the British. He did see the two lanterns in the Old North Church. And he did mount one of three horses. William Dawes, another. Cheswell went Wentworth, a third. But when he rode, he knew that the British had two mandates. Number one, he knew the British wanted to take our weapons and stores of ammunition. Always be very careful about a government that starts coming after your guns. I don't know about you, but I'm very glad that this administration it's not looking at gun control after every little thing that happens. And I'm sorry for those things that have happened. Those egregious things that have happened. But it's not because of the gun. It's because of our society that has removed God out of it. Amen? But Paul Revere, he rode knowing that they wanted to take our weapons, our stores of ammo. Lexington, Concord areas where we had those actually stored. That was one of the big hot spots. And he also knew they wanted to kill two men. They wanted to kill John Hancock. Because remember, he was the one that signed his name nice and large. He was the President of the United States during the Declaration of Independence. Now, why did he sign his name so large? You know why? Because he knew the king needed reading glasses that he always didn't have with him. And so as soon as he opened it up, he wanted his name to be easily identifiable. And actually, when he signed it, he said there, John Bull referring to... Great Britain, as they do Uncle Sam to America. Here, John Bull will double the price on my head. And they did. So they wanted John Hancock dead. They wanted Samuel Adams dead, because he was the one, of course, that was the originator of the first Tea Party, okay? Where the, go where the government of Britain said, hey, you need to unload this tea. If you don't, we're going to grievously tax you. He said, no problem. We can unload it. We'll just unload it seaward and not landward. Amen? And he said, so you want a good cup of tea? Come on down to Boston Harbor and bring your cup and a little sugar and some cream and just dip it in anywhere you want because it's going to be a tea party tonight. And so we know about that as well. Well, they, they hated those two men. So they wanted to kill both of those two men. Well, as Paul Revere rode through that night, almost riding his horse to death, but fortunately he had a very strong steed. He was right in one man's house. Because he knew there was a family tie between John Hancock and a man by the name of Jonas Clark. Jonas Clark was a man very influential there in the Lexington Concord area. So sure enough, he rode and to one man's house, didn't say anything clandestine, knocked on the door, door was open, walked in, there was those three men. He said, John, Sam, the British are on the move. I just saw in the Old North Church two lanterns. Most likely, they could be coming west here to Lexington Concord and then going north to Boston, and they're after your lives. Neither one of those men said anything. They looked at their host, Jonas Clark, and they said, are your people ready? He said, yes, my people are ready. 
I've been preparing them for just this day. Uh, who was Jonas Clark? He was a pastor. He was the most influential man politically in that area. See, long before any kind of talk show host supplanted or circumvented the pastor, the pastor was the man you went to for everything, and government as well. And the hundred and some minute men that were summoned that next morning, that faithful day in April, were summoned by the bell tower of Jonas Clark's church, all men and deacons from one church. And Jonas Clark had preached from his pulpit something time and time again. He said, we're getting ready, possibly for war. But if it ever comes, do not fire first because God will bless a war of defense much more than a war of offense. But if they mean to have a war, let it begin here. Those men walked out on Lexington Green, faced off 800 British regulars. The commander of the British regulars chided them, cursed them, lay down your arms, you rebels. Their commander said, stand fast, boys. We know that we are on God's side in this. And before our side fired one shot, a shot rang out from the British. A shot heard around the world. And the war for independence began. And 18 men lay dead and or dying on Lexington Green, all members of a pastor's church by the name of Jonas Clark. Don't you ever let revisionist historians tell you that Christians moved by God didn't have an integral, critical role in the founding of this nation. This nation was founded by Christians. This nation was founded for the gospel of Jesus Christ. And Reagan said this, be careful, because we're always one generation away right. from losing our freedom. Right. We don't pass it on to the next generation by our blood. As we say today, not by our DNA. It needs to be protected, preserved, so we can hand it to these next ones coming up that will be the future guardians for liberty so they, they can stand beyond any kind of prejudicial judgment, looking at God and allowing God through and by his light to show them truth in every facet, to have a biblical worldview. That means filtering everything through and by the Word of God. Not listening to the news. Too many people listen too much to the news. Amen? We get our acronym news from North, East, West, South. That's where we get our acronym news from. It should be today, D, 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 D. Daily dose of dumbing down. Because all they do, and I'm not talking, I'm just talking, I'm talking about all the news. All of the mainline news. Is all about sensationalism. Right. Where they begin with good evening and then proceed to tell you why it's not. Yeah. Right? Yeah. Hey, in your hand you're holding the Bible. That's the good news right there. Amen. Amen? And that's what we need to hold on to. Realizing that this country was founded to bring about the gospel not only to this world, but to, the, to, the, to this nation, but the entire world, you see. So we need to hold on to those things and realize how precious we have it here in this country. How that we have forgotten so much about our nation, even the governance of our nation. I mean, it's amazing to me because uh, we have an office now right across from the Supreme Court of the United States in Washington, D.C. Uh, we got the office right after the first Capital Connection, and I'm going to show a video about the Capital Connection, maybe uh, in uh, Sunday school, to kind of give you an idea what that is. But uh, after that, we were provided with an office. It's an old uh, 1800s townhouse. We have one floor that's allocated to us and a parking lot, which is worth its weight in gold in Washington, D.C. And across from us is the Supreme Court of the United States. And uh, when I walk out, you know, it's wonderful. I, I love the federal city. Even with everything going on and all the mess going on, it's still, it is the epicenter for 
world politics and the power of this world. It is, you might say, that shining beacon of liberty where Daniel Webster said in 6,000 years, do you understand, people of America, that miracles seldom cluster? 6,000 years is referring to all of recorded history. People say, well, that's a long time, Brother Harding. It's really not a long time. You think 6,000 years is 60 people living 100 years back to back. We could put all of recorded history in this one section yeah. right here. So it's really not that much time. But it's everything to us. He said in 6,000 years, miracles seldom cluster. He said, Americans, it clustered in the Constitution. Hold on to the Constitution. Because if the Constitution ever falters and fails, the whole world will be plunged into anarchy. The liberty, that light, will be extinguished. That's why we, God's people, need to hold on to what's going on here. That's why I want to tell you something. This nation, the future of our country, will never be in the hand of the heathen. Ever. Unless we give place to them. See? Now, we have been giving place to them, but we're taking that back again. God says, if my people, which are called by my name, shall humble themselves and pray and seek my face, then will I hear from heaven, forgive their sin, and heal their land. You see, but we, we are the ones that hold the future of our country for our children and our children's children. But we need to remember certain things. It's so obvious about what has gone on in our country to even just very young people. But we have forgotten so much about this document right here. Let me see. I want to um, get somebody up here. Let me get my friend Kimberly. Come on up here, Kimberly. Okay? And uh, she's just getting her shoes on. She's, she was comfortable there. It's okay. <laughs> Amen? It's okay for little ones to be comfortable in church, right? Yeah. And Kimberly, how old are you? She's seven. I asked her last night. That's God's perfect number. Does that mean you're perfect? And you said, no. Okay. <laughs> that was a good answer. Amen? That shows she's a smart lady. Now, I'm going to show everyone how smart you are. Okay? And this is the Constitution of the United States. This is the highest law in the land based upon the Bible, which is the highest law in the universe. Okay? And this something right here says all legislative powers, that means all law-giving powers, okay, Kimberly, here and granted shall be vested or put in a Congress of the United States. We haven't rehearsed this. I just want to ask her a question. If all law-giving powers are given to the Congress, how much is left over for the other two branches? None. Thank you. Give her a hand. Here, here. Take that with you, okay? Seven-year-old, like this, said, well, all law-giving powers are given to the Congress. That means there's no law-giving power left over for the Supreme Court That's right. or the President. Yeah. So my question to us today is this. Why, then, are we allowing the Supreme Court to change, negate, and pass laws. There are only nine people. They're just supposed to interpret the law. Every time they do, it's their opinion. So how did we allow them back in 1973 to step out of their constitutional boundaries, huh? where seven out of nine of them said that life doesn't begin at conception, it begins at birth? How do we allow that to happen? I'll tell you how. We didn't know. We forgot you see, who the Supreme Court is. We forgot what a seven-year-old figured out like that. Why not this president alone, the last president, president before, going all the way back to, I mean, decades ago, have allowed them to sign executive orders, which are laws, which are unconstitutional. Reason why? We, the people, have forgot our own document that we had a seven-year-old remind us of today. See, it's simple things like this, and that's just the snowflake on the tip of the iceberg. And you understand ice here more than most people in America, OK? Now, I, I step out of my office. Supreme Court's right there. Supreme Court said we can no longer view the Ten Commandments in public. But when I look at the Supreme Court, I look at the side where the judges enter in. 
And at the pinnacle of the Supreme Court, all the inferior lawgivers are working the way up, profiling, and the supreme lawgiver is at the apex, and he's looking straight out, the only one, and he's holding two things in his hand, and they're two tablets of stone, the Ten Commandments. And so I thought, well, I'm going to take a tour, because the Supreme Court said we can no longer view the Ten Commandments, but there they are. So I took a tour, and in the tour, well, this, is, this is exactly what would happen. Where the judges all sit is here, let's say. They're looking out. I walk through wooden doors that shut when they're in judgment. Guess what's carved in the wooden doors? Ten Commandments. So when they are judging, they're staring at the Ten Commandments because our founding fathers wanted to remind them. They don't judge for themselves. They judge for God. They're in God's stead. That's why they wear that robe, hiding their appendages. It's basically illustrating that they're standing in God's stead. You don't see their arms or their legs as readily in a robe. See, that's why a robe is worn. Over to, if you're sitting where most people do when they go to watch a Supreme Court bring its opinion down, and I've been there when some of those things have happened, over to your right or their left, is this huge relief, bigger than life, for all the lawgivers and the prominent lawgiver, all by himself, is out there, huge, with, again, the Ten Commandments. And in Hebrew, you can see, written the Ten Commandments. And so we were in there, and the guy said, are there any questions? I raised my hand. I said, yes, didn't the Supreme Court say we can no longer view the Ten Commandments in public? He said, that's right. I said, then what's Moses holding right there? You know what he said to me in front of several hundred people? Oh, those aren't the Ten Commandments. Those are the Bill of Rights. And I waited for someone to dispute that, and no one did. So I raised my hand again. He didn't want to answer me. It was like a tennis match. They were looking at him and looking at me, looking at him, looking at you. You can answer this guy's question, what's going on? So finally, as a teacher answering a student that they didn't really want to hear what he was going to say, he said, yes. I said, I don't remember Moses being at the Constitutional Convention. <laughs> And I don't remember the Bill of Rights being written in Hebrew on two tablets of stone. <laughs> and that was the response of the people. They just kind of started laughing. And this guy turned red. And this is what he said. I know that's what we're supposed to say. Bye. 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 See, look, we shouldn't care if the world thinks we're crazy. They shouldn't think we're stupid. I, I heard a story of a very successful businessman. He was going to a business meeting. And there was a little bit of a problem with his front tire. So he got his tires ro rotated. And, and the guy didn't put the lug nuts on the back passenger tire on tight, just finger tight. All the rest of me, you know, did the wrenching and all the rest of it. But So this man is proceeding to his business appointment. And the lug nuts, because of the vibration of the wheel wore off one after another. And finally, the last lug nut literally fell off. And before the wheel fell off the car, he could feel, obviously, something going on. He stopped just in the nick of time, walked out. The tire was still there, slightly cocked, but all of the spindles, you could still see them through, all the bolts, but no, no nuts. So he looked over, and just by chance, he had stopped in front of insane asylum. And there was an inmate looking at him through the gate. And out of exasperation, he went. And the inmate very calmly said, well, uh, you can take one lug nut off the last three remaining tires and put that fourth tire on and proceed safely to the next gas station and get some more lug nuts. He went, that's great. What are you doing in there? He said, well, that may be crazy, but I'm not stupid. I'm sorry to say, Washington, D.C., uh, many times they've gone off the rails. And the reason why is we're not there providing the light and the soul, or haven't been for decades. We have now been for the last six years. They're in great numbers. And with the right position and yet the right disposition, walking in and influencing these people. And I'm going to tell you in Sunday school some of the amazing things that we've seen. But I have seen also 
these monuments. I've seen the 90-some-year-olds, these World War II veterans, coming in on the honor flights, and they go to their World War II memorial, and they look at that little summation. It's an excerpt of what FDR said after the bombing of Pearl Harbor. And they're, they're looking at it in puzzlement, because what he said was, in so many words, this is kind of a paraphrase, America's righteous might will endure to the very end. We'll ensure that this type of atrocity is never perpetrated upon Americans again. We will end in victory. And then he said these words, so help us God. Those are the four words, even though a social liberal, as FDR was, united, solidified us as a Christian nation. But they're not there. These 90-some-year-olds, they're looking at that quote and saying, where, where are those four words that we heard as we were gathered around our radio on the farm, as, as we were watching and, and listening outside of a store as the crowd gathered that even didn't have radios as the president gave that speech to the combined session of Congress. Where, where are those words? Well, two men said the same thing. Number one, Washington said, if we lose recognition of God's hand in our culture, God's hand in our nation, if we lose the idea that we have a dependence upon him, there is no way that our nation will last. We over on the right. Karl Marx, over on the left side of ideology, said this. Take the heritage away from the people, and they're easily persuaded. See, that's why they want to remove God out of the consciousness of Americans, why these young people are growing out without knowing that history means his story. And God so com conspicuously absence, his, he's absent from secular history today. And why they simply don't know the uniqueness, the amazing experiment of liberty that America is. With uh, a few last verses, I close, and I have about six minutes. If you would, please go to Judges chapter 2 and verse 7. Let's see how the people of Israel did. Remember what it says in Isaiah where the whole head is sick and the whole heart faint. We forget, then we forsake. Where here is the third downward digression. It says in Judges chapter 2 and verse 7, the people served the Lord all the days of Joshua and all the days of the elders that outlived Joshua, who had seen all the great works of the Lord that he did for Israel. So these are the people that saw it, you see. They were trying to pass it down to the next generation. Verse 8 of Judges chapter 2, And Joshua, the son of Nun, the servant of the Lord, died being 110 years old. Look at verse 10. And also all that generation were gathered unto their fathers, those that saw, those that experienced God and his miraculous works. And there arose another generation after them, look at this now, which knew not the Lord. The whole head is sick, you see. Nor yet the works which he had done for Israel. And the children of Israel did evil in the sight of the Lord and served Balaam. And look at this in verse 12. And they forsook the Lord God of their fathers, which brought them out of the land of Egypt. The whole heart faint. And here's the third downward digression. And followed other gods. of The gods of the people that were round about them and bowed themselves unto them and provoked the Lord to anger. And they forsook the Lord and served Balaam and Ashtaroth and the Anger of the Lord was hot against Israel. He delivered them into the hands of spoilers that spoiled them. And he sold them into the hands of their enemies round about so that they could not any longer stand before their enemies. Uh, Say, Brother Harding, why do you have this ministry? I don't ever want to see America on the auction block. Well, what can we do, Brother Harding? We're not many. Look, God's never needed the many. Yeah. Oh, it, was, it was Gideon's 300,000, right? No, it was Gideon's 300. Why? Because when God uses just a minuscule amount, he gets all the glory, doesn't he? No one else can take it. It's God's glory. It's his honor. Now, very quickly, two verses, and I'm done, and I have four, four minutes. Your pastor said, get done at 10, and I'm going to follow orders from headquarters. Isaiah chapter 1 and verse 9. You say, Brother Hardy, why are you, why are you excited? Because God's still on the throne. And because he loves this country and he's not done with us yet. And because there are some very powerful principles that you and I can get a hold of and stand upon and see our country go forward. 
until God calls us home. Amen? Isaiah chapter 1 and verse 9. I know there's one interpretation of God's word, but there's many applications. I'm going to make an application with your permission. It says, except the Lord of hosts had left unto us. Look at this now, a very small remnant. You ladies know what a remnant is, right? The piece of material is really not good for much of anything. And God could have said remnant, but he didn't just say remnant, did he? He said small remnant. Well, wait a minute, he didn't even just say small remnant. He said very small remnant. Except the Lord of hosts had left unto us a very small remnant. We should have been as Sodom, and we should have been like unto Gomorrah. You know why God has not brought catastrophic judgment upon this country yet? Why he allowed us to go through eight years of attacks on our culture and our constitution? I'll tell you why. Because of a very small remnant. The reason why we don't see a nuclear attack from Rocket Man, and I love that term, by the way. I'm looking at some of the reasons right here today. Because you got up this morning. What, what was the temperature this morning? 20, 2,500 below zero? But you got, and, and you're here, you see. I was surprised. I got up, you know. And we live in Maryland, right? If it gets anywhere near zero, people start running to the hills, okay? But there was all kinds of people out. I said, I love Alaska. I love the great state. These, these folks are tough up here. I like this. And I'm not afraid of the snow or the cold and the blow or even a little ice. I proved it by coming here today. But what I'm saying is I'm looking at some of the reasons why right here, you, today, that God hasn't brought catastrophic judgment and there's a precious little baby in the, mom, in, in the arms of grandma, safe and secure. Because you're here to please your God, to follow your pastor, by thy grace and for thy glory, God, you see. This last verse, Proverbs 28 and verse 2. And this is an amazing thing. It says, for the transgression of a land, many of the princes thereof, that means a lot of people messed up this country, but by a man of understanding and knowledge, the state thereof shall, it's a promise, be prolonged. Say, but Hardy, think America is going to fall? Oh, yeah. But not on our watch if we do what God wants us to do. I, don't, don't, I never want to see it fall on our time here. We, God's people, need to do what? Just be people of understanding and knowledge, knowing that when the wicked Gentile nation of Nineveh were under a 40-day judgment call, a unwilling preacher, partially digested, showed up by the name of Jonah. No wonder they paid attention to him. You could smell him before you saw him. And when you saw him, it wasn't any improvement whatsoever. But he preached an eight-word message. And those wicked Gentiles turned. And God prolonged the stay of that nation from 40 days to over 100 years later. See, I want to see that in America, don't you? Because, see, I want these young people to grow up and have the same opportunities that we've had because we serve a God who sits on the throne of eternity. We serve the God of miracles. We serve the God of the impossible. And we can ask God to do what, Brother Harding? Lord, I see these young people. I'm going to ask you. Have mercy on us for murdering our babies. Have mercy on our nation for turning our back on the nation of Israel. I'm glad that's changed. Have mercy on us for validating alternate lifestyles that threaten the traditional family. And Lord, give us one more day. I'm standing before you. I'm making up the hedge. Stand the gap before you for the land that you should not destroy it. And then, Lord, I'll see you tomorrow. Because I understand this. If we don't pray a determination now, one day we'll be praying on a desperation. And may I say this? We need, before anything else, 
understand this nation was born because of the gospel of Jesus Christ. It all goes back to the gospel. If there's anyone here that doesn't know Jesus Christ as Savior, you're not sure that your home in heaven is secure. I want you to come forward today because we have keys that will unlock the chains of your sin and give you a home that you can look forward to from here on. I'm not talking about knowing that Jesus Christ is the Savior, that the Bible is the Word of God, that there is a heaven to gain and hell to shun. I'm talking about knowing Him as your personal Savior. Big difference. What's the difference? Head knowledge, heart knowledge, heaven or hell. So I want you to come forward today in this invitation, but Christians, I think we need to get serious about praying for our country. And I think we need to dedicate ourselves to ask God to have mercy on our country each and every day. Just ask Him for one more day and then tell Him you'll see Him tomorrow for one more day. He said, how long have you been doing that, Brother Harding? For well over 13, 14 years now. Boy, you know what? I think God would be honored if He had some additional people praying the same way through His book, His principles, His promises. America's Alzheimer's disease. Would you stand with me? And you say, Brother Harding, I, I want to be involved in that kind of prayer than I, without any music playing or anything else, I just want you to come forward to this old-fashioned altar right now. Say, God, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to pray every day for mercy upon my country. I don't normally go to the altar. might be a good time to start coming to the altar, knowing where our country is. Oh, there's some great things going on. There's some very egregious things going on as well. Brother Hardy, I'm not sure today that I'm even going to heaven. And Brother Hardy, would you pray for me about that? If there's anyone here that doesn't know Jesus Christ as Savior, that you don't know him as your personal Savior, why don't you lift your hand up right now and let me pray for you. Anyone like that at all? Lift your hand up very quickly and right back down again. Don't know for sure that I'm going to heaven, but I'm positive I don't want to go to hell. Take some courage, but I'll guarantee you right here today, Today, it'll be much easier to do when you can still do it than to stand before the great white throne judgment and see God point at you and say, depart from me for I never knew you into the lake of fire prepared for the devil and his angels. Say, Brother Hardy, would you pray for me? No one's going to come to you. I'm not going to embarrass you. All eyes are closed. All heads are bowed. But you just want me to pray for you. Lift your hand up. Let me pray for you. Put up quickly and I'll pray for you. Anyone like that at all? Yes, I see that little boy right there. Heavenly Father, thank you for loving us. Dear God, thank you for the Bible, how it illuminates our minds and our hearts and allows us to live for you in the day in which you have given us for such a time as this. Bless now, we ask, all of these things in the hearts and minds of we, your people, for we ask it in Jesus' name.